serendipitously. Um, and uh, they worked together before um, in the past. But Jacob has written a, a book, which everyone has here, The Collaborative Organization, which is about sort of the future of work and collaborative strategies inside your company. It's an awesome book um, based on a lot of research and a lot of sort of frontline um, uh, experience that Jacob has. He's the principal co-founder of Chess Media Group, which is an analyst firm um, that we've used as well, as well as um, I know other folks that um, rely on Jacob. We've actually been on panels together speaking um, in San Francisco, I think at a few different conferences. Um, I can speak um, that he's very uh, credible in his resource and uh, his background. And you can read more about Jacob um, regularly. He has a column now in Forbes that's published on a regular basis. But he's also been highlighted in Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, Heat Magazine, and Mashable. Uh, I'll also say that he's not only being endorsed by me, but he's being endorsed by the CIO of the United States, CMO of Dell, the CEO of Unisys, the CMO of SAP, and the chair of MIT Sloan Management Review, which really said um, this book has made a big impact on companies, and there's a groundswell that's really building. So, Jacob uh, Morgan, thanks for coming out today. Look forward to um, hearing a bit more about uh, what you have to say today about the future work. But everyone, please give uh, Jacob a hand.
Okay, what if you had to think of a synonym? What's a synonym for employee? So if you had to think of another word that's the same as employee, what, what word would that be? Yeah? Team member. Team member. Good one. Any others? Resource. Resource. Any others? Asset. Asset. These are all very positive words. That's great. Any others? <laughs> okay, so we have team member, asset, resource. Now, what I found particularly shocking when I was doing research for the book is that I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at some of the words that, you know, we throw around all the time, but we really don't think about what they mean. And these are words like company, manager, employee, work. And I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at what some of the synonyms were for these words. <laughs> and so the first one up there, synonyms for work include drudgery, <laughs> struggle, and daily grind. Synonym for employee include cog, servant, slave. <laughs> And synonyms for manager include slave driver, boss, and zookeeper. And for company, we have a club, a crew, or a gang. So basically the exact opposite of what a lot of you guys said. And it's really interesting when you think about that, because that's how a lot of our companies have been built for the last 10, 15, 100, 150 years. They were built on the notion that that's, you know, work needs to suck. That employees are just hogs in the machine, that managers are slave drivers, and that everything we do is just miserable. Drudgery, daily grind, it's horrible. So this is how a lot of our companies have been constructed, and now we're at a point today where we're kind of, you know, trying to completely redefine what all of this means. So what's actually happening today? I think there are two key things that are happening. Um, the first is around data and technology, and the second is around people. And I'm just going to give you some context before I attempt to get into the dictionary. So around a thousand years ago, uh, or so the story goes. Around a thousand years ago, chess was invented by a mathematician and inventor uh, whose name was Sissa, S-I-S-S-A. -S 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 and the ruler at the time was so impressed with the invention of, of chess that he said, pick anything you want, any, any prize you want is yours. And the mathematician thought about it for a while and he said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want to put out a chessboard that has 64 squares. On the first square, I want you to give me, put one grain of rice. On the second square, put two grains. On the third square, put four, and basically double it every time. So one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, until we get to the end. And when you get to the end, that's how much rice I want you to give me. And the ruler thought about it for a while, and he's like, okay, like that's a lame thing to ask for, right? How much rice could that possibly be? So the ruler goes to his servants, and he says, okay, figure out how much rice that is, and you know, pay the guy off. And the ruler was actually a little insulted. He's like, why would you ask for such a, you know, I can give you anything. Why would you ask for a little bit of rice? And so the serpents came back to him, and basically it turned out that that is more rice than exists in the entire world. It's more rice than we produce globally today as a, company, or as a, as a world. In fact, it's so much rice that it would be equivalent to building a rice mountain of Everest tower. <laughs> so it is a massive, massive amount of rice. So why do I even tell you that story? Because we're seeing a lot of the same things happening with data. And Ray Kurzweil actually has this notion saying that we're at the second half of the chessboard today. And the second half of the chessboard essentially means that we're at a period in time where data and information is multiplying at extremely rapid rates. In fact, we're actually outpacing Moore's Law, which predicts that things are going to double uh, around every two years. So just to give you some context, in 2011, there were around 1.8 zettabytes which were produced. In 2012, 2.8 zettabytes, and we're predicted to exceed 40 zettabytes by 2020. So to give you some context around how much data that actually is, 1.8 zettabytes, which is what we were producing in 2011, is enough to build the Great Wall of China two times higher out of 57.5 billion 32 gig iPads. <laughs> 1.8 zettabytes is the equivalent of everyone getting 215 high resolution MRI scans every day. That's 1.8 zettabytes. We're predicted to be at 40 zettabytes by 2020. So you can get an understanding of what kind of massive amounts of data we're looking at. Not only that, but by 2020, there are predicted to be 30 billion connected devices. Devices. 30 billion, we're talking about toasters, refrigerators, we're talking about everything that you can possibly imagine being connected. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, more later. We're seeing data coming from everywhere and from everywhere. So we're going to have massive amounts of data. The other thing that we're seeing is more new people. You know, not just the, the increase in population, but we're also seeing uh, millennials taking over as the majority 
workforce. By 2020, millennials are supposed to be the majority workforce. By 2025, they're going to be 75% of the workforce. And by 20, uh, 7.5 billion millennials by 2020, 8.3 billion millennials, uh, or I'm sorry, total population, 7.5 billion people by 2020, 8.3 billion people by 2030. So it's not just that we're going to have more people, but we're going to have different types of people working for our companies, and these people are going to be millennials. And I am a millennial, but I'll give you another example. This is my little brother, Josh. And I use him in all of my presentations. He never knows that I actually use him in any of them. <laughs> One day he'll find out. But Josh, I think, is a good example. He, he just turned 21 years old. And he's one of those kids that's really into you know, photography and filmography. Uh, he bought all these really expensive cameras for himself. He bought himself. And he learned how to use them. And he essentially built a business for himself doing film and editing and photography and all that sort of stuff. Now, when I went to school, you needed a four-year degree and probably between sixty dollars to $100,000 to get a degree in film. Who wants to guess how Josh was able to learn how to do this today? YouTube. YouTube? That was a big one, yes. How else? Social media, right? YouTube, forum, discussion channel, all that sort of stuff. So this kid who's 21 years old essentially started off with a little tiny camera that I think he got for a birthday or something like that. Um, he started doing film stuff, he got some clients, he upgraded and upgraded and upgraded. And every time he did that, he, he learned how to use all these things and how to do all these things for free. Right? He didn't have to pay a penny to, to learn how to do any of this. And I tell you this because this is essentially what the future of uh, the future workforce is going to look like. Right? Josh has no idea what it's like to get 250 emails a day. He doesn't know what it's like to sit in a cubicle. He doesn't know what it's like to use an internet system. And he doesn't know what it's like to not be able to connect and engage with people. So you take somebody like Josh, you have to think about, how is he going to do with your company? Or even before you think about that, you have to wonder, why would he work at your company to begin with? Right? So when Josh graduates college, he's going to have a choice. He's going to have a choice of companies to go work for. Now, is he going to work for the type of company that is going to put him in a cubicle and tell him he has to show up 9 to 5 and get 250 emails a day? Or is he going to work for a company that says, work anywhere, anytime, we support a flexible work, uh, work environment, we believe in employee feedback. You know, we're going to make our organization uh, supportive of, of, of what you want to do. I don't think I need to answer that question, but I think we all know he's not going to work for the company that is going to sit him in a cubicle and have him answering emails all day. Right? So investing in the future of work and thinking about these things is absolutely crucial for the survival of any business because you're going to be looking to attract and retain top talent, and that's how it's going to happen. So I put together uh, a very simple infographic, basically looking at how the world of work is evolving. And I'll just go through these quickly. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, by all means, feel free to ask. So the first thing that we're seeing is moving from a higher hierarchical organization to an organization where the structure, the structure is a little bit more uh, flattened out. I'm not talking about a perfectly flat company, but you know, people are starting to talk to other people regardless of seniority level, regardless of where they are within the company. You know, it's not unusual now for an entry level employee to start in a company and the CEO will go on their collaboration environment and say, hey, congratulations. Right? How else would that be possible? You know, a couple of years ago, CEO, you know, entry level employee starts working there, and the CEO is like some mythical creature. It's like, is that him? Oh, I have to get a picture of him. <laughs> Nowadays, right, that's not the case. You know, the CEOs are talking to everybody, employees are talking to everybody. So we're seeing organization um, communication and collaboration flatten out a little bit. Next is moving from fixed working hours to flexible working hours. You know, the traditional model of any organization was that you have to show up and you have to show up 9 to 5. You have to wear the same thing, and ask a lot of questions, just sit there in that box and do your job. Right? And you know, the reason for that is because a lot of our companies were modeled after the military, right? And, you know, the military was always, you know, I say jump, you say how high. You wear the same thing, you come in at the same time, everybody does the same. Uh, and only a couple people at the top have the information that they disseminate, uh, you know, when you need it. So now we're seeing this shift towards flexible working hours. Right? A lot of people now work from home. As long as they get their stuff done, who cares when they do it? As long as you have a connection to the internet, you can do anything and everything that you want, whether you're in an office, in a coffee shop, or a co-working spot. We're also seeing a shift from um, hoarding information to sharing information. Again, the traditional model for organizations was always the managers and the executives are going to keep all the information as close as possible, and they're going to tell everybody else what to do. And that's how a lot of our organizations have always been constructed. And now we're seeing information being shared. Right? We're seeing this reliance on collective intelligence. We're seeing where managers are actually asking employees for feedback and using that feedback to make decisions. 
So information is opening up. We're also seeing a big shift as far as how leadership is, um, is working. The traditional model of leadership has always been based around the fear and punishment. Do what you're told, or we're going to have to have a talk. Do what you're told, or you're going to be fired. Do this, or this. You know, Basically, bad things happening to you if you don't do your job. But now we're seeing that model completely shifted. And a lot of smart leaders at progressive companies are doing what I like to call follow from the front, which is essentially their job as managers is to remove obstacles from the paths of employees. If you're an employee that's looking to work on something or get something done, my job as a manager is to empower you to do that. Not to shame you, not to scare you, and not to instill this kind of fear in you. A couple other things that we're seeing. A big shift from on-premise te technology to cloud-based technology. Right? On-premise, the, the, the dinosaur notion where if you want some sort of technology up and running, you have to call somebody and they need to come with a box and install it and configure it, and it takes who knows how long, right? That model is, is, is quickly dying away. The reality is that now, within a couple minutes, you can be up and running with the highest grade of enterprise class software, right? In just a couple minutes. And it's not, you know, deploying the best class of enterprise software today is as easy as setting up a Facebook page or buying something on Amazon. Set up your profile, answer a couple questions, drag and drop your logo where you want it, you're up and running with the best piece of enterprise software that you can find. So this notion of on-premise technology is really dead, right? And the cool thing about that, the big shift that we're seeing is that Employees are just taking things into their own hands. They're saying, I'm not going to wait for corporate. I'm not going to wait for IT. I'm not going to wait for anybody else. My team, whether they're 10 people or 100 people or 500 people, we found a better way to get work done and you can't stop us. We don't need manager approval. We don't need to run it by IT. And we don't need to show it to legal. <laughs> just need to put, enter your credit card information and that's it. <laughs> right? That's all you have to do. Um, one of the organizations that we worked with is a, a large financial institution. You know, I talked to one of the executives that runs one of the business divisions and 40,000 people. And he said, yeah, we don't have time to wait for corporate. They promised us they're going to do something in around a year, year and a half. But we have problems now that we need to solve. So I just went and I deployed it myself. And within a couple of days, we were up and running. Right? There's no reason why it takes so long anymore. They just didn't. Uh, we're also shifting from email as being a primary form of communication to being a secondary form of communication. You know, when email first started, um, I, I kind of remember. Uh, <laughs> But when email first started, it used to be for asynchronous communication, right? I send you an email, you respond back to me in a day, maybe two days, right? Nowadays, you send an email, people respond back to somebody in two hours, they think you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> they start asking around, like, have you seen Jim? I emailed him, I, where is the guy? I don't know what's going on with him. So email has basically become the type of a glorified chat messaging program. And you should see some of the emails that people send. They're, you know, you have one spectrum where people just respond back and say, okay. <laughs> See ya. Or, or just K. Right? That, that's an email now. We actually send an email that says K. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And then sometimes people go on these tirades of emails where it looks like it should be something that is written in a personal diary or a journal. And they just go off on these emails. But in the email, you have to read it because there's that one sentence in there that you need to get your job done. That one little snippet, that little piece of information. Uh, and it's like this weird, sick game of people are like, Read this long essay, everything else is irrelevant, it's about me, but just find out one thing that you need to get your job done. So, you know, there, there are better ways for companies and for people in the organizations to communicate and collaborate. And we're seeing that big shift for organizations where they're not relying as much on email to get things done. Next, shifting from the corporate ladder to creating the ladder. The corporate ladder is essentially you get hired into the department, whether it's sales or marketing, and you have to build up, right? You start off as a sales coordinator, a sales manager, a senior sales manager, a director, blah, blah, blah. Uh, until you hopefully get somewhere good. What a lot of employees are doing now, and what we're seeing is that employees are able to create their ladder. Right? So you might get hired in the sales department, but thanks to these collaborative technologies, you might be passionate about design. And you might be participating in design groups and sharing design tips and design ideas. And what happens is that you get recognized for doing that within your company. And then eventually what happens is people in the design team start saying, hey, this guy's really good. Why is he in sales? We should have him on the design side. And so the employee is able to kind of create their, um, their path within the company. And it's one of the reasons why I always say that employees are doing themselves more harm than good by not using these technologies, right? You want to use these technologies because you get recognized for your, um, your thought leadership, for your expertise in a particular area. You want to use these technologies because you can help shape the path that you're going to take within the company. You, you know, if you don't use it, you're just hurting yourself. The next one is shifting from siloed and fragmented companies to connected and engaged, right? Sales used to not talk to anybody else. Marketing used to not talk to anybody else. 
There was a study done in 1977 by a sociologist who basically said that once employees are 200 feet away from each other, the chances of them communicating and collaborating is virtually nil. Okay? 200 feet. That's down the hall. <laughs> so imagine you're sitting there, your buddy's down the hall, and you want to go talk to them, and you're like, ah, no. <laughs> Not going to do that. I can't take those 200 steps today. That's, I'm just going to email him. Okay? <laughs> so, you know, th th this notion of um, connecting and engaging is, is, is a really, really powerful thing that we're seeing. And, and it's one of the reasons why organizations are allowing employees nowadays to work anywhere, anytime, on any device, because if somebody's far away from you down the hall, you're not going to really talk to them anyway, so you might as well, it's the same as being across town. Um, and finally, the next one that we're seeing is working at the office uh, to working anywhere, a mobile employee. And the notion of the office is essentially dead. Not to say that we're going to necessarily get rid of offices, but offices don't need to be um, mandated. They don't need to be forced, they need to be as an option, right? We have an office, if you want to come in, if you want to come in to work there, great. If not, you can work from home, you can work from a co-working spot. Uh, a lot of organizations are actually trying to tell us, is, is a good example, they're essentially the telecommunications company, um, Comcast of Canada, if you will. 30,000 employees, huge thing that they want to do is have around 60 or 70 percent of their entire workforce be either full-time or part-time from home. They're spending a lot of money on real estate, and they're like, employees don't even like coming here. <laughs> Why don't we just let them work from where they want to, you know, wherever they want to work? If we need a meeting, we'll open up a pop, uh, you know, uh, ad hoc co-working spot, or we'll do something else, and, and we can engage employees that way. A lot of organizations are also renting out their extra office space, right? Now that they're allowing employees to work anywhere, they're renting out their spaces because they have these huge buildings and big offices and lots of empty space. So all that brings me to the five predictions, um, which I very well could be completely wrong about. <laughs> But we'll have to talk in 10 years. So, <laughs> um, so the five things I think that we're going to see happening over the next uh, 10 years. Like it's scary to even say 10 years. Like 10 years, the next decade. Um, number one, I think we're going to see a new definition of employee. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about these as well. I think we're going to see a new definition of manager. I think we're going to see some evolved platforms to the point of being a little scary. Um, I think we're going to have to see big companies working like small companies. And finally, I think we're going to see that everything that can be automated will be automated. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what I mean there. I decided to break those predictions up into a couple areas. The first one is around people. So the new definition of an employee, a.k.a. COG. <laughs> um, you know, we're starting to see some of these things happen now, but I think in 10 years this is going to be the standard. And we see, we're seeing a lot of really interesting things happen in 10 years. Um, there are a lot of predictions saying that by 2020, 40% of the entire United States workforce is going to be freelancers. Right? That's millions of people that aren't going to be employees. They're going to be freelancers. That's almost half the entire United States workforce that isn't going to be employed fully with any type of company. Um, so that's a really interesting thing that, that we might see happening. And we're starting to see trends like that as well because you know companies like Odesk and Elance, um, they're, they're skyrocketing. Um, we're starting to see all sorts of interesting companies disrupt traditional models, right? The Uber, uh, co-working spaces, all sorts of really interesting things over the past couple of years have been happening. And for an organization, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that more later, it essentially means that you can develop ad hoc projects and put together ad hoc teams, right? You just, you need something done, boom, put the right people together, you're done. That's all it takes. So I think the three key things that we're going to see, hopefully, within the next 10 years, um, the first, working anywhere, anytime, on any device is going to be a standard, right? It's just going to be a standard. It's just going to be the way it is. It's not going to be a question. It's not going to be a discussion. Employees are going to be working on the go. They're going to be working from anywhere. Broadband is going to be everywhere. And this notion of the office is going to be, it's going to be an option, right? So I think we'll hopefully see less corporate real estate as well. Um, number two, I think all employees are going to have a voice within the company, right? I think all employees are going to start to have a serious say in how the company is operated, how processes are developed, uh, what decisions are being made, and, and how the company as a whole, you know, what direction they're moving in. Right now, we're starting to see a little bit of that, but overall, I'd say most organizations are still not there yet, right? Some organizations are, you know, maybe a little bit at the forefront. But for the most part, employees still really don't have a voice within their company. They essentially get hired to do a job, and they have to do it. That's it. I think moving forward, employees are going to be, uh, they're going to have much more influence as far as the work that they're doing, who they're working with, how they're working, where they're working, and they're going to be able to shape and create their own types of career paths within an organization. One of the other cool things that I think we're going to see, and some companies are experimenting with this, is this notion of taking badges and certifications from you from one company to another. Right? 
right? So a lot of organizations, like one of our clients, uh, they're in the education space. And one of the things that they wanted to do is to create this learning and growth and development program for their employees. And they said, you know, one of the things that we want employees to do is not just to be able to learn and grow within our company, but when they leave our company, they, we want them to be able to take these, these badges and these certifications and things that they get with them. So I think we're also going to see some really interesting things around how um, you know, digital environments and scores are going to transcend platforms, right? They're going to go with us where we go. They're going to become a part of our identity regardless of what company we work at. And we start to see a little bit of that now, right? I mean, a lot of organizations now, they're hiring now based on what's your cloud score, how many Twitter followers do you have, how big is your, your Facebook network, do you contribute somewhere. The first thing that most recruiters do nowadays is they LinkedIn, Google, they search for you, right? They want to know what your digital life looks like. So I think we're going to see a lot more structure around that within the next year. <laughs> New definition of manager. Um, that is essentially what you know, the definition of manager used to be, right? The, the, the slave driver. Um, formerly, the zookeeper. <laughs> I think we're going to see some really interesting things around the manager. I think this notion of following from the press is going to become the standard. I don't think the manager is going to be positioned as kind of this, this guy sitting in his ivory tower or in a corporate office. I think the manager is going to be much more somebody that is, um, you know, not uh, you know, he, he's he's serving the employees instead of the employees serving the manager. I think we're going to see this huge shift in roles where the goal of the manager and the way that the manager is going to become successful is by removing obstacles for, from from the paths of employees. And the only way to do that is to understand your employees, to talk to your employees, to provide. Uh, better and rapid feedback to employees. And essentially the manager, his role is going to be to service the employees to make sure that they can do what they need to get done. Right now it's completely opposite. Right, right now it's the employees who are all trying to serve the manager. How can we make you look good? What can we do for you? Tell us what to do. I think we're going to see a complete 180 of that within the next 10 years. The next thing, greater understanding of technology. I think understanding technology is going to become a standard for most managers within companies. And it's, it's really not there yet today, right? You, you talk to a lot of managers and they either, they've never heard of these technologies or they don't want to research, they just, you know, they're, they're used to doing things their own way. I think the future manager is going to become a technology whiz, right? He has to, because the technology is going to be what's going to empower his team. And if you don't know what's going to empower your team, you're not going to have a good team. So that's the third one I think we're going to see of managers greatly shifting towards understanding and grasping and you know willing to use technologies within the company. Technology. Um, this is the second area where a couple predictions are. And this is where it gets kind of creepy. Right? <laughs> and when I made this presentation, I didn't want it to be all around technology, um, which is why I included some of the other areas. So one of the interesting things that we're going to see, I think, um, is smart platforms, right? Watson and Siri for the enterprise. Imagine having this type of this. Has anybody seen iRobot with Will Smith? Okay, that's happening. Right? That little computer, Vicky, that, that's Watson right there, right? There's no way that that's not going to happen. I think that within the next 10 years, we're going to see that all these collaboration environments and all these organizations are going to be connected by this type of a, a smart uh, virtual piece of software that is going to help you make decisions, right? When you create a document or when you're doing some type of work, it's going to provide better ways for you to do it. It's going to tell you who you should be connecting with. It'll automatically create things for you. Um, eventually, you'll be able to control it with, with voice or with, with motion. Um, Fox News actually really sh they showed a really cool video a couple uh, a couple weeks ago. I don't know if anybody saw this, but they completely revamped how they're going to be delivering news going forward. And basically, the news anchors now they have these sticks that they walk around with, and they point the sticks at the screens and they shift. You know, they ship what's being projected on all the screens with their hands, right? So they now control what's being displayed just with a little stick that they walk around and they just move things around with their hands. So it, it's really, really interesting. Um, Elon Musk from Tesla put up a, a, a YouTube video that went viral where he showed how he's actually using his hands and motion for engineering, right? 3D, the, the way they create engines, the way they put things together, he's spinning and turning and moving things out with his hands. So I think we're going to see a lot of really cool things with, um, with motion control and voice control. But the scary part is I think these technology platforms are going to know how we work better than we do. Right? They're going to start to tell us things that we didn't know about. They're going to tell us who we should be working with, why we should be working with these people. So I think we're going to see some really, really interesting things around how we're going to have to work with this type of, I don't want to call it artificial intelligence yet, but this type of a smart platform. Right? Watson, for example, is already doing this. 
Right? Watson is playing the role of customer service agent, where it can answer customer service request calls better than any human can. Right? We saw Watson went on Jeopardy. We see how Watson is helping doctors um, diagnose various issues because Watson can now read scans from MRI and from various things. So we're going to have this type of artificial um, intelligence that's going to be playing a really crucial role in how we work. And again, keep in mind, we're looking 10 years out. This isn't happening tomorrow. In doing research, I also found this, and this kind of freaked me out a little bit. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the 2045 project, but I'll just walk you through And This is like a series. These people have funding. They're doing this. This isn't just an idea. So <laughs> it's even silly to say it. The avatar, uh, the avatar thing that they're building. They, so between uh, 2015 and 2020, they are going to have a robotic copy of the human body that you can control, so they say. Right? A couple years after that, they're going to have an avatar in which a human brain is transplanted at the end of somebody's life. So in other words, death, they say, is going to become obsolete. Where if your brain is still functioning, we'll put it into this new type of a body, and that body can now walk around. It's kind of crazy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Little blue weird thing walking around. Um, so, and these are actual things, and this isn't that far away, right? A, a decade, we're looking at the, 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 um, the 20, 20, 2025 range, where they're saying that they're going to have avatars and they're going to be doing these things. Now, it, it's hard to imagine how this is going to impact how we work, but um, personally, I think it would be really weird to work with like a, a guy that died and his brain is just you know, kind of hovering around in some body. And, anyway, um, but we're going to see some really interesting things as far as how we're going to be working with these weird types of things that we wouldn't think were possible through holograms, through telepresence. Um, through this type of avatar. And I put this up here not because I necessarily think that it will happen, but it's, it's just an interesting discussion to see that this is where this is where things are going. And the Internet of Things is one that I think is very fascinating and actually, actually happens. Right? The Internet of Things is this notion that by 2020 we're going to have 30 million devices connected. And these are all sorts of devices. Right? These are machines talking to machines. These are machines talking to humans. Wearable technology. Everyone, everywhere is connected. Right? So literally everything in your house will have an IP address. You can control everything with your phone, your toaster will talk to your washing machine, to your refrigerator, everything is going to be connected. And we think about it and we kind of laugh a little bit, but I mean, it, it, it's very much uh, you know, this notion of smart cities. People are building smart cities now, where the entire city is basically connected, and everything talks to each other, and the whole city is just run by this connection, by these computers. So, and this isn't that far away, right? I mean, this is 2020, we're talking four or five years, so it's not that far off where we're going to have this, this internet of things. And we're, we're seeing a lot of this as far as machines talking to us, right? So um, a lot of aerospace companies, when there are issues on airplanes, right, the notifications automatically come to humans, or the machines will talk to other machines to help diagnose problems. So we're seeing a lot of really cool things happening as far as the internet of things goes. The next big area that I think we're going to see a lot of, um, a lot of interesting things happening is around companies. Did anybody read the new Malcolm Gladwell book, David and Goliath yet? Check it out. Okay. So I haven't read it either, but um, I, I read some of it actually. And the premise is very, very interesting. And one of the things that I think we're going to see happening is that size might start to become a disadvantage. Right? Just because your organization is massive doesn't mean it's going to be successful, doesn't mean it's going to be better, and it doesn't mean you're going to have a future there. And the notion of Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, Gladwell's book David and Goliath, um, was basically the premise that we always thought that Goliath had the advantage, right? He was bigger, he was stronger, we always thought that he was the one that was going to win. And Malcolm Gladwell was saying, well, actually, you know, it was David that had the advantage all along. We just assumed it was Goliath. And so I think we're going to see a lot of these things happen with big companies. Right? Big companies assume that they are so safe and so secure. But a lot of disruptions are coming which are, coming which are, um, which are helping us rethink that. Right? 3D printing is one. Where essentially what's going to happen is any consumer is going to be able to create anything that they want. Right? So any individual that has access to 3D printing can now be a competitor to any company that creates or produces some sort of a product. So we're going to see a lot of things happening there. Um, the transportation industry got completely disrupted with, uh, with companies like Uber and with Lyft and with all these other ones. So big companies are going to have to learn to move quicker. Right? There's no reason why big companies need to move so slow. So I think three things are going to happen for companies. One, we're going to have to see more rapid decision making. Um, I don't know if it's going to involve organizations splitting up into smaller pieces. It can involve organizations just acquiring everybody that they see as a competition. 
But I think this notion of these giant behemoth companies, um, us, you know, we shouldn't assume that they are going to be the way that uh, the future of work is going to happen. Right? I think we're really seeing a big shift there as far as organizations um, sh uh, shifting from operating like big companies to small companies. The second one is ad hoc talent assembly. Right? And it's this notion of that organizations are going to be able to rapidly and quickly put together any type of team that they want to handle any type of project. It's going to be easy. It's going to be done instantly. And I think the smart platforms are going to help us do that. Right? Because the smart platforms are going to know who's at the company, what their area of expertise is, what their subject matter expertise is, and they're going to be putting these, these teams together for us. So this ad hoc talent assembly is going to be huge. And finally, distributed and connected. Uh, I can't tell you how many organizations now um, they say they have an office in some remote part of the world, and it's really just one guy working from home that has Wi-Fi, <laughs> right? And they say that that's an office. And I think we're going to see a lot of this happening, and we already are. A lot of these companies are just investing in these little small areas, uh, distributed yet connected. Basically, anywhere you have Wi-Fi access, you can have an office. There's no reason why you can't. It can be anywhere. I talk to companies all the time where it's like one guy working in some remote, you know, remote island somewhere, and it's just like they have an office there. So it's very, very interesting that we're going to see this distributed, yet connected type of company. And finally, I think we're going to see that everything that can be automated will be automated. And automation, I'm talking like robots. Right? I'm talking about robots that are going to be taking jobs from, from people. Um, and a lot of people talk about this because they say, oh, you know, the robots are taking jobs from people. But it's actually the fault of our companies because the way that our companies have been structured and created, we've been essentially creating jobs for robots we didn't have robots, so people have been filling them, right? So it's kind of like the robots are taking the jobs back that they've always been, you know, that they were always supposed to have. A lot of the drone work that we do, humans aren't supposed to do that. We just didn't have robots there at the time. So organizations are going to shift to this type of more engaging and more type of um, inspiring, inspiring type of work. So we're already seeing blue collar jobs in some areas, depending on the research that you look at, starting to decrease. Right? Robots are now, they're cooking hamburgers, they're making drinks for people. There was a video the other day about how um, a restaurant in Japan, um, people order food through an iPad, and the food gets, you know, the chefs are still there, but there's no servers anymore. Everything just gets sent to you on a conveyor belt. And you order and communicate with the kitchen through an iPad. So servers are now obsolete. Um, we're seeing, you know, checkout when you go to a grocery store, right? We're seeing people that are disappearing from checkout jobs. So we're seeing this, this type of notion where um, everything that can be automated will be automated. And we're going to see robots in a lot of weird places, right? You know, who knows if one day it'll happen where we all have a little personalized robot like an iRobot that, you know, helps us cook and helps us clean and helps us do all those things. But it's hard to imagine that not happening in the next 10, 20, 30 years, right? It's hard to imagine that we won't get there. Um, I also think that that means we're going to see new jobs created in different areas that we didn't know exist. Good example, right? A couple of years ago, we didn't have social media coordinators, we didn't have content managers, chief collaboration officers. We didn't have any of these types of roles because these types of things didn't exist. So who knows what the future job is going to look like, right? It could be, um, it could be training robots, it could be servicing robots, it could be, you know, I I ideation and creativity. I think that stuff is still going to be very much relying on humans. But I think all this quote unquote grown work is going to be done by robots, and we're starting to see that happen now. And the cost of buying these types of robots is far less than, um, than employing a bunch of humans. The companies are doing it, especially in manufacturing, when it involves putting stuff together. And finally, I think within the next 10 years, we're going to see a lot more of robots working with humans. Uh, there was a recent article, I think, on the New York Times, or uh, even CNN. They were showing a video that works in manufacturing plants with humans, and the robot is essentially aware when humans walk into the room, right? And they, they put sensors on the robot where if a human is nearby, the robot will slow down. The robot, like, it has these fake eyeballs, which are really weird. And you can see where the robot is thinking about working because it looks there. And so and it's working side by side with a human. So we're seeing these really, really weird things happening. Um, and I think in the next 10 years, it's going to become much more, uh, much more prevalent. Right? That, that's the second half of the chessboard, so to speak, that Ray Kurzweil was referring to. And we're at a point now where it's rapidly accelerating, right? All these things that I'm talking about, um, within the next 10 years, could happen sooner, they could happen a little later. But all in all, we're seeing this rapid increase in technology. And I think it'll be a very, very, very interesting time in the next uh, you know, five, 10 years. So all that brings me to three things to think about. The first is, how are you going to adapt to new technology? Not just new technology that's sitting right in front of you, but new technology that's coming in a couple of years down the road. 
right? What's going to happen within your organization? How is technology going to impact you? The second is how are you going to adapt to the new people that are going to be working within your company? Millennials, people that are coming after millennials. How are you going to attract and retain top talent to work within your company? How are you going to adapt to new people? And the third is how are you going to adapt to new behaviors? Right? New behaviors, good example. Everyone now is very comfortable living a very public life, right? We share things on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. You can look somebody up and get everything you want, everything you want about that person. A little while ago, that wasn't possible, right? So it's only been within the last five years or so where we all became so comfortable sharing information and building communities and engaging with others. Um, it's easy for us to find information on Google. If we have an issue with a company, we send them a tweet and we expect rapid response back. So all these new behaviors are entering our organization. We want to easily be able to connect and find people. We want to be able to get access to things anywhere, anytime, and on any device. We want to be able to work anywhere we want. We want to be able to work anytime we want. These are all new behaviors that are entering our organizations. And the thinking point there is how are you going to adapt to those new types of behaviors? So these, I think, are the three key things to think about. Um, and I can open up to questions now if anybody has any questions about any of this. I know some of this is a little. Yes? Right? Most millennials and, and 
the next generation after that, they all seen uh, parents and you know friends and people that are a little bit older saying how much they hate their job. And all those people have been working at big companies. So when the new workforce comes about, they're sort of like, you know, why should I work for a big company? I don't know anybody that's ever liked working for a big company. Um, but companies are starting to experiment with things, right? at and was experimenting with something where they have this kind of like internal venture program where there are small teams within the company. Um, they come up with ideas and they need to pitch it to get funding and then they have a team that goes off and runs that and that becomes kind of like a separate entity. I think TELUS is doing some really interesting things as far as what they're trying to empower their employees to do uh, on the team side. Um, who else? ING Direct Canada, I think, is doing some interesting things. ING Direct Canada, there are a thousand people. And the CEO of the company, if they're using a collaboration environment, he came out there and gave their quote unquote employees right to pitch. And he basically said, All the employees here, tell me what you don't like within the company and where to work as a team to help solve it. So they're doing some really interesting things about empowering employees. Um, but for the most part, a lot of companies are just getting started with these types of technologies. They say they want to do it, but they really aren't there yet. It's hard, right? I mean, you have a company that's 200,000 people. Um, you're getting to a point where it kind of becomes unmanageable. Right? And you have to deal with politics. It's just all, a whole mess of things. It slows down everything. Um, I feel bad for the people that work at you know, social media teams with these big companies because even to send out a tweet, it's like, okay, I need to get corporate, I need to get HR. <laughs> and this one tweet that was supposed to go out today is now going to go out next week. <laughs> so it, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And it's one of the reasons why I think big companies have to start to learn how to move like small companies. What, what's your take on Marissa Mayer and Yahoo and this whole notion of uh, coming back yep. to the office? Everyone always asks that. And <coughs> HP is another company. I don't know if you guys read the announcement. HP made that same. I think Best Buy was another one. I think those are all temporary things. Um, I know a lot of people that work at Yahoo that still do work from home and at HP. And it, you know, one of the big reasons why Yahoo and these companies are doing this is because when they started these types of flexible work environments, they didn't really have a strategy or a plan in place for why they were doing it. It essentially just kind of happened and um, everyone kind of run them up, right? There were employees there that were saying they're working full-time from home that had part-time businesses that were like, you know, running clothing and creating water bottles and doing all sorts of different things. There were no policies, there were no standards, there was no technology in place to support anything. So it, it was just a mess. And so a lot of the things that I heard so far are good. They're kind of like regrouping, getting everybody on the same page. They're gonna deploy technology, to, you know, empower everybody and then hopefully release everyone back out. Um, but you know, in the case of Yahoo, they were kind of at an extreme, you know, people had like two, three jobs because they didn't know what to do about it. Um, they were at, an, at a very extreme point where they needed to do something. So I, yeah, they, they make the right call, I think, but I think it'll just be temporary. Any other questions? Yes? Do you think, um, going back to the work-life balance and, and the big companies working for like or like the old companies, do you think some of these changes maybe would drive us Jobs that fit better, so the work-life balance isn't a balancing act. Or like in the middle ages, when somebody did shoes, that's what they did. They were basically yep. in shoes. So do we revert to something like that where we do X, Y, Z, and that's what we enjoy doing, we like doing? There doesn't have to be a work-life balance because we're doing something that fits better. Does that make it easier? To yeah. Yeah, and you know, it's certainly possible. You know, a lot of the recent studies came out around millennials that basically say millennials are willing to take a pay cut. Basically, what they prioritize is doing meaningful work over making more money. And so millennials are much more selective about where they work. That's why more of them are living, you know, a, lot of, a lot of them live at home because they're looking for that right job that they want to work at. They don't just want to go work for a paycheck. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's the appeal of a lot of these types of companies. You know, Google is a good example, right? People that work at Google tend to really like working at Google. They're a big company, but it's really fun to work there. It's kind of like Pinocchio and Island. Um, <laughs> but the challenge is the work-life balance, right? People, you know, people sleep there. They, they, have, they have everything there. Um, so it's possible, but I, I don't think it's possible for an employee to always, always be working, even if they love their job, right? I mean, eventually you need to switch off. You need to maintain a personal life. You, if you, you can't, um, I don't think it's going to be possible to do it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think. That's the appeal for a lot of the smaller companies, is that you can control things a little bit more, and you can do things that you're interested in, and you can, uh, there's, a, there's a greater growth path that people recognize you. You, you know, that's the appeal of working for a smaller company. You work for a massive company, people don't know who you are. You literally are, you know, a cog in the machine. And it's frustrating. Um, and people can assume that that's where you have job security, but you look at where a lot of these, you know, BlackBerry laid off how many people. We saw Kodak, uh, we saw um, 
Circuit City, we saw Polar, I mean, all these companies that were massive that we thought are never going to go anywhere, they're just going into nothingness. So big company doesn't mean job security. I think it's much more important to take a job where you actually enjoy the work that you're doing. Yeah, you no, know, you have to do something you hate to pay the bills. Maybe that makes exactly. things easier. Exactly. Any other questions? Thank you very much.